Hello and welcome to another video and today we've just popped down to a beach at low tide in North Wales and we're going to do a little bit of an evening forage and I thought I'd bring the camera with me and we'll see what we pick up. We're, we're mainly down here aiming for prawns um, for a bass fish but if we do well um, I might make this into a catch and cook video because um, we've got Mike as well and we might do something like that if we forage anything um, that we might eat so yeah we've not got the biggest tides um, so I'm not hugely confident, but we should pick up a few prawns. Hopefully we'll find something else of interest for you. Um, and perhaps we'll take something back um, and cook it up for you as well. So yeah, let's get foraging. A couple of essentials. When you're foraging, we've got this hook. In case we find any uh, crabs or lobsters or anything that we can perhaps fish out of a cave. That's more for um, rock pool marks and things than down here, but you never know. And a nice sturdy net that you know won't fall to bits when you run it through uh, kelp and rocks and things. And that, that's all you really need. I'd say it's worth wearing waders. I always do. Um, a bucket to collect whatever you, you're catching. And then you're good. Obviously make sure you check your bylaws, check with IFCA or um, whoever you need to in your local area with what you're allowed to take and what you're not. And yeah, we're just going to have a look along the low tide mark in these rock pools by the rocks and see if we can find anything. If you're a YouTube forager as well, always make sure you've got a waterproof camera case because uh, I made that mistake before. Something we've got here is quite interesting. This is the common starfish. And as the name suggests, it's the most common species you'll find around UK shores, but it's not the only one. Uh, they get a lot bigger than this, but this is obviously a juvenile. And these guys actually eat shellfish, most specifically mussels. And what they actually do is exude their stomach outside of them. It goes between the cracks in the shells and they can actually digest the, the mussels from the inside out, which is really interesting. Um, a lot of you guys might fish for flatfish if you watch my channel and you, you'll often fish for place on mussel beds. Um, these guys actually can decimate a mussel bed in great numbers quite quickly. So if you're fishing for place and you, and you certainly, you suddenly notice the fishing go downhill, it's often because these guys have got on the mussel bed and started eating all the mussels. So just a point of interest, but I find them quite interesting. So we've actually got a few species of fish as well, which we've retained just to show you. The first one is this which is a little species of rock pool specialists known as the long-spined sea scorpion. Uh, there's two types of scorpion fish in the UK, the long-spined variety, which is this one, and another species called the short-spined sea scorpion. Now, confusingly, the short-spined is actually a, a larger fish than this one, the long-spined sea scorpion, which doesn't grow as big, but they do get a little bit bigger than this. Um, we're going to release this one. We have absolutely no use for it. If you, were, if you were really tight, you might use it for a live bait for bass, but we've certainly never bothered. Um, really nice little fish, they actually can have a, a huge variety of morphology in terms of the colours and the patterns on them, but yeah, nice to see. We'll pop this one back. So we're just down here on the beach looking for a few lake prawns or cockles or things to have a forage and we found what looks to be a dead shore crab here. Um, it's not in fact a dead shore crab, if you pick it up and open it, um, it is in fact the exoskeleton and, uh, of a of a, a shore crab which has uh, which has shed its exoskeleton and come out as a soft crab or a peeler is what uh, um, and it's gone on and then it's, it's uh, sucked in some water stretched its new soft exoskeleton uh, which it will then hide under a rock and, and harden so I would imagine that under one of these rocks here there's a lovely soft crab which would be a perfect bass bait but that's not what we're after today. So we've got some winkles down here. These are, you can eat these. Um, this is a dog whelk. Uh, they're a predator of barnacles. They, uh, they've got a, a hard rostrum, I think it's called, that, uh, that they can poke out and grind through the shells of barnacles and eat them. Uh, this, is a, this is a whelk. Um, these are commercially harvested species around here. Uh, actually see a lot less of them nowadays since the since people have been whelk fishing, but they're shipped off to Korea where the market value is very high. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there's any knock-on effects of that because uh, large hermit crabs use these for their um, use these for their homes. Um, uh, so it'd be interesting to see if the uh, if there's a decline in these shells over time from the from the new fishery. Well, you'd expect it, that to have a knock-on uh, knock-on uh, effect on the on the hermit crab success, but who knows one of the intricacies of the, uh, the the foreshore So the second species of fish we found which these two species are, are the most common you would expect to find Foraging in this way uh, This is a species of fish called a shani, which is very lively um, 
Now, this species grows a lot, lot bigger than the long spine sea scorpion. You can find some actually quite large. And again, a really nice uh, pattern species of fish. They get really dark, really light ones, and they can have lots of different patterns on. And this species, unlike the long spine sea scorpion, can actually survive a whole tide's uh, length of time out of the water, so long as they stay moist. So if you have a rock that doesn't actually have any water underneath it, but it does have kelp, any different kind of macroalgae that, that will hold that humidity and keep the fish quite moist, they can survive out of the water for that whole tide until it comes back in and picks them up. Great little things. So we've just found a, a soft crab here. It's not quite a soft crab as such, but it's what we call like a crunchy. Um, so if I, if I bring that over to the camera there, you'll be able to see that. It's like, I'm just gonna focus on the camera sleeve. There you go. You'll be able to see the set, the shell is actually soft. You see that popping back there on the camera? So it's very thin and it's very papery um, and very, this this crab isn't, so you can see it's got no aggression, so it's not it's not in the mood for fighting because these claws will be so soft that they'll just crumble as soon as it as soon as it tries to pinch me. Um, so this this we found under a rock, so we'll put it back now and it'll it'll finish hardening up its uh, its shell, its new shell, and then that'll be uh, that'll be its defence against predators. Okay. So this is one of the things that we thought we might uh, might find a few of today. Um, these are cockles quite a large one here um, it's about as big as they get and we were hoping to find a few more of these but the weather's just gone cold so I'm not sure whether um, the majority of these are now buried under the sand uh, or whether someone's been down here it's a mix of sand and mud down here so um, so the, the cockles quite there's quite often a number of cockles just lying around for the picking so we didn't bring any any tools with us today but maybe that might have been a better option uh, because it doesn't seem like there's many of them lying around today but we'll we'll keep these for now and see if we get get some more nice this also doesn't seem like the perfect uh habitat for cockles if, if you were looking into actual cockle fishing and stuff you'll find that they actually seed on much sandier beds uh, without all this rock and kelp and stuff but Mike has had a lot of success finding them around here in the past, so they obviously are capable of living here. Over low water, we continued foraging, and amongst the usual things we expected to find, we were lucky enough to find and catch something a little bit special. Right, guys, I've just chucked Mike the camera because he has just caught a lobster, which neither of us can actually quite believe. If you look at where we are, it's not good lobster habitat. Well, it's not bad, but this is not where we would expect to have found a lobster. We, we didn't think that was on the cars tonight. The water quality is pants. I don't know how we've seen it, it's been under this bit of pipe in here. Um, I'll show you the lobster now, hopefully without losing it. And we're hoping this is going to be a perfect, uh, a perfect candidate for a catch and cook for you. There we go. If we take a look at this lobster, if I look underneath it carefully, we can see that this is a male, which is denoted by, uh, as far as I know, I'm no expert, these little uh, these little white dots on this, this first set of legs here and the angle of, uh, of the tail there. That tells us this is a male lobster. We also look at the tail and we'll notice that there's absolutely no V-notches in that tail at all, um, which you wouldn't tend to find often on male lobsters anyway, but the hens often have a V-notch cut into them, either if they've had eggs or if fishermen notice a, a faded out V-notch, they'll re-notch her as a breeding female. Um, yeah, this, this lobster would have to be, I think it's 87 millimeters from the back of the eye to the back of the carapace um, to be a keeper, which we can, we can tell by just by the eye. I don't even think we've got a tape measure with us, this specimen is. So yeah, we're really buzzed at this. Fact, all credit goes to Mike for for getting this one, I didn't get it. I'm amazed that he pulled it off catching it. it. There was a lot of scooping going on and a lot of mud, but we've got the lobster anyway. So that, for a little evening fraud and cockle session, is the right result. Well, after that excitement with the uh, with the lobster, we've got something else to show you here. This is the embryo or egg case, often known as the mermaid's purse, of a dogfish, also known as the lesser spotted cat shark. Um, two species of cat shark in Britain, the lesser spotted, which us fishermen will know as a dogfish, and the greater spotted, which uh, we often call a bullhuss. But you can actually see the tiny little embryo of the dogfish in there. This is in the stage where it's, it's discernible from the, the yolk sac there. 
and it's going to start absorbing that to get its nutrients before it eventually gets large enough to to be absolutely stuffed into this egg case i've seen these when they're when they're full and they can barely fit in and at that point it'll come out and start foraging for itself these egg cases are not meant to be just loosely washing around they're attached to weed i'm not sure whether we've kicked this one up or um whether it was just loose anyway, but that, that's what these little strings are about on the end. They, they attach themselves to hold fasts so the tide doesn't wash them away. We're obviously going to put this one back um, as best we can, but I'm not sure how well it'll do now it's off its hold fast, but very interesting to see. You don't find those very often, so quite cool. Well, I think this is going to be the last uh, the last find we show you today, because as you can see, the, the sun is setting behind me. But what we've got here is a little edible crab. Now an edible crab is something that if we were to get an of size one we might have also thought about taking that back for a catch and cook um, but this one is is a juvenile it, it's not even uh, close to an adult they do get quite big I don't know exactly how big but that would be a good size edible crab across the carapace so this one is severely undersized so we're going to pop that back now um, yeah I would uh, I would say it's been a very very successful forage today certainly better than we we thought we'd do however we we did struggle on the cockles and the prawns which is what we came down for but i think we're, what we're going to put that down to is the water temperature we've had a cold snap in the last week or two and i suspect that's that's been detrimental to the prawn fishing but we did pick up that lobster which i still can't believe um mike reckons that that was probably coming into these rocks uh, before it's going into its molting stage um, which is good news for us because that is the prime time to eat them and um, so it's perfect again for that catch and cut but yeah, we really didn't think that was on the card, so it was really nice that, that that's happened and it's made a video uh, a bit more doable, especially since this mic can actually cook, so it's a perfect time to find a lobster as well. So yeah, we're going to pack up our stuff now, get that lobster home, dispatched, and we'll show you catching, catching, cooking that up. There we go, heading off the beach, victorious. Always a nicer walk back when you've got something cool in your bucket. Um, we're going to go back and cook that lobster up now, so stay tuned for that. And uh, I'd just like to say as well, I always like to just cheekily drop this into the video. If you did enjoy this video or you enjoy anything on my channel, just do me a favour and just hit that subscribe button because I never used to bother, but now I have a YouTube channel. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, any questions at all, if you want to put them in the comments, no worries. Anything I don't know, Michael know. And we should be able to help you out with this kind of thing. So yeah, thanks for supporting the channel. Okay guys, so we're back in Mike's kitchen now and we're going to cook that lobster up. Um, I'm not much of a cook myself, I'm not very good at it, but luckily Mike's a chef. So he's going to do something with the lobster now and we'll talk you through it. Do you want to say what you're going to do? Or... Cool. Yeah. So uh, the first thing we, well, I better go and get the lobster first. So here's our bonus lobster from before. Um, we can see this one's still alive. We've had it on ice for a few minutes just to slow it down. Um, I'm going to kill it quickly now uh, and the best way to do this um, is to find this this point in the middle of the X on the top of the carapace um, and what you want to do is put the knife into there and bring it down forward through the front of the um, through the front of the lobster quickly uh, as quickly as possible and then that will kill it and then what we're going to do is we're going to put it straight into a, um, a pot of vigorously boiling water uh, bring it back up to the boil and then start our timer. So we're going to kill this lobster now. There we go. So that's one dead lobster. That then goes into our pot. You see it all hangs limply there, so it is actually dead. Into our pot of boiling water. Temperature up. And then as soon as it starts to boil, we'll start our timer for 12 minutes. So our lobster has just started to come to the boil, so we're going to transfer it to a smaller burner and lower heat and get started on uh, the Thermidor sauce. I say Thermidor sauce, this is uh, my take on a Thermidor sauce and uh, also depending on what, on what ingredients are in the house. So we're going to let this pan heat up uh, and then we're going to come back and start that. So our time is on uh, for the lobster. Um, we worked out that it's about 12 minutes for the size of lobster. Uh, it's about 700 grams. Uh, oh, we did actually measure the uh, the carapace uh, just to be on the safe side. It's well over legal landing size at 95 millimeters. So we're just gonna we've got um, got a nice piece of butter here, about 50 grams. So we're just gonna let the let the milk part of this evaporate off. And over here we've got one shallot 
which we've got in fine dice. Uh, so we're just going to sweat this off till it's translucent and soft. And after that, we're going to add some this is some parsley and some tarragon. Uh, and this is a non this is a non uh, this is someone that all the purists will uh, will hate me for. But we've got some fine dice sweet red chili there. It's not very hot. Just I had them lying around uh, and I fancy them in the dish. So. So there we go, foamed off with the, um, with the butter, so in with the shallots. And then we don't want to colour these, we just want to, uh, we just want them to soften. And we're going to turn the heat down on those and just let them sweat for a minute or two. And we'll cut back in and see in a minute. So our shallots have sweated down, um, starting to go nice and translucent, just before they're starting to brown. So in with our mild sweet chilli. Um, again, this, this won't need long, just to, just to soften it, release a little bit of that colour and flavour. Um, I've got herbs to go in next. So we'll see you shortly. Okay, so again, the purists are going to hate me for this, for not making a separate bechamel, but we've got our butter in there, we've got the shots and the um, and the chilli sweated down nicely, so in with a um, tablespoon of flour, which we'll just cook out for a second in the, uh, the rest of the butter that's remaining. Cook that out, and then what, we'd, what we're aiming for here is the, the start of a bechamel um, type thing, which just to, just to give the sauce some thickness. So, it's foaming up nicely, so we're going to start with a little bit of, start with a little bit of milk, Stirring quickly to stop it going lumpy, and then just to thin it out, I've got some um, some fish stock here. Actually, tell a lie, didn't have any fish stock in the house. Uh, so what we've got is a mixture of vegetable stock and a couple of dashes of fish sauce, which is a great little uh, great little cheat if you run out of uh, you run out of fish stock or can't be bothered having it in the house all the time. So we're just going to carry on adding, thin this out with the stock. As you can see, it's going nice and thick. And the rest of the stock. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simmer this for a second, just to just to get it um, all thoroughly mixed together, uh, starting to simmer. And then we're going to take it off the heat and add some double cream. Uh, and then we'll we'll put it back on the heat and let it let it reduce a little more. I'm gonna leave I'm gonna leave putting the the fresh herbs in for a minute or two just because it'll help them keep their colour and vibrance at the end of the dish. So rather than rather than have them boiling away, uh, we'll we'll add them later on. So we've just taken our um, our sauce off the heat. We're gonna add what's in there? Probably three tablespoons of double cream. Getting this out of the container before as I flick it all over the camera. There we go. Stir that in off the heat, um, and then basically we're going to we're going to reduce this to a, uh, a consistency where um, where it'll it'll hold together as a as a nice thick creamy consistency, which we're going to use to to bind the lobster tail uh, and claw meat with later on. So get that thoroughly stirred in. And then once it's stirred in, I'm going to get that back on a low heat, put it gently to simmer, uh, and bring it down by, probably don't need to reduce this by that much, but bring it down by, I don't know, 20%. Uh, and then uh, we'll, see, we'll see you shortly. Okay, so the time has just come off for our lobster. Um, so we've got a bowl of cold water here. Uh, you should really use ice water to cool the lobster down. Uh, but because we'll be heating it up in the sauce again uh, when we grill it, I've actually taken this off a minute or two early, um, so I'm not I'm not I'm not concerned about it overcooking. So we'll just lower that into the cold water, help it cool down quickly and stop cooking. I will actually run the cold tap on top of this just for a minute or two just to help it cool down. And what we'll do is we'll leave the lobster to cool down. Then we'll show you splitting it in half, how to get into the claws, and then we'll uh, we'll finish the sauce. Uh, while while we're here, while we've got the sauce, 
while we've got the sauce going here, um, this is reduced down a little bit now. As you can see, it's a nice, thick, creamy consistency. Uh, Realise that in our haste, we've poured ourselves glasses of wine, but forgot to add some to the dish. So again, apologies to the purists out there. Uh, having just tasted it, I don't feel the need to add any wine now. Absolutely delicious, rich, lovely. So we're going to leave that just as it is. Uh, it can come off the heat now. Uh, we'll let it cool, and then we'll finish it off. Okay, so we've got our um, we've got our sauce here, uh, which we're just going to add our handful of parsley and tarragon to. Stir that in. Just remove the little bit of shallot shallot skin that got into that somehow. Um, and then we're going to add for colour and flavour. Going to add uh, recipe actually calls for English mustard, but I've only got English mustard powder, so that'll have to do. Um, so a teaspoon of English mustard powder. Well, heat teaspoon in a bit of English mustard powder. Give that a good stir up, and then this will be the binder for our lobster meat. Uh, lobster is just cooling in the background now, so the next thing we show you will be uh, will be opening that lobster up and getting the meat out. I'm just going to add another little bit more English mustard there. Um, haven't quite got the colour I want it to yet. But we're nearly there. Okay, let's give it a little taste. Nearly double dipped. Stop myself just in time. Oh, lovely. Um, and then the, the final, uh, well, nearly the final bit of this sauce uh, is some, get some parmesan. So we've got about, we've got about 50 grams of grated parmesan there. And what we're going to do is just save a little bit of the top, save a little bit of parmesan for the top, uh, and I'll probably grate a little bit of mature cheddar in with that, just to just to spread on top of the uh, on top of the lobster when we when we give it its final grilling. Okay, so our lobster um, been chilling, so to speak, uh, in its bowl of cold water. So we're now going to finish prepping it to uh, remove the meat from it. Um, so, a lot of people prefer to cut a lobster open from the underneath. Gives you a bit more control over it when the, with the tail trying to curl back on itself. Um, so, you started to cut before when you when you killed it. So you're gonna just finish that. So, push strongly on your knife down the middle line. Lean on the heel of it if you need to, and then that will split your lobster into two halves. So that's how we deal with the body. Um, the claws slightly differently, probably slightly easier to twist these off before you cut the lobster in half, but we'll break the claws off and we'll show you how we extract the meat from those as well. There's our two claws, we've got the crusher claw there and the cutting claw, um, so this one's much more power, this is what it used to grab hold of its prey and uh, immobilise it. So um, first of all we want to devein the meat, so starting at the at the back here, just with the tip of your knife, just pull out this little vein of of gunk. Yeah, that's just the tail end of the of the digestive tract. So we can then get your thumb in there and just pull the whole tail meat out. Same on this one. Remove the vein. Not a vein, of course, but intestine. Yeah. and then out with that one as well that's the tail meat nice and simple um, forward of this area here we've got all the uh, all the mouth parts and the, the stomach sac and we're going to get rid of that this here this um, this this browny green uh, sludgy looking stuff here this is actually the tamale um, this is how um, this is how lobsters store their, their fat similar to a, a liver uh, so this this is full of flavour. So we'll scoop this out and we'll we'll put this in with our um, with our uh, sauce, which is which is still cooling at the moment. So that's the main uh, body of the meat out. We've also got some leg in, le some meat in the legs here, which you can you can break these sections off and roll them with a the rolling pin and, and get your little bits of meat out of those. I'm not too worried about that. What I'll probably do is I'll just smash these carcasses up anyway, and uh, and I'll boil them, make a make a bit of a, a like a like a lobster stock. And that can that can form a variety, the base of a variety of dishes like a prawn bisque or anything like that. 
so we've got these these lovely claws here uh, full of meat but quite difficult to get to and the only way to get around that is to smash them so back of a nice heavy knife uh, that's probably overkill I'm a bit out of touch so that one was a bit heavier than I'd like you want you don't want to do it too hard because you don't what you don't want to do is you don't want to uh, put force loads of bit, fragments of shell into the meat that's actually worked out quite well and you can see now that this so normally these shells, well not, not, not all the time, but these shells can quite often be very, very difficult to break and I would suspect, uh, seeing as we thought this lobster was on its way into the, the shore to malt anyway, it probably makes a bit of sense because this shell is a little bit thinner than you would normally uh, expect, so it's, it's started to extract the nutrient back out from its shell, make it thin and make it easy to, to malt from. So we can pull out this little tendril of meat here from the lower part of the claw this is the main claw meat and we'll shred that up in the sauce and uh, just be aware of this piece if it becomes detached uh, this is quite unpalatable to, to find in your mouth when you're eating the lobster so that's the lower part of the claw removed uh, cleaned of meat so we break it apart at the joints and then you can either smash each joint or you can use a little skewer to poke out these pieces of meat from from in between them. Uh, it's a little bit fiddly, but you get the hang of it quite quickly. So there we go, there's the, a bit of the tail meat there. So if we poke that through, sorry, tail meat, not tail meat, the, the, the middle claw. There we are, so there's the a nice chunk of meat from that middle claw. Add that to the rest of it. And then one more section here. Um, I'll probably go and get a little skewer to, oh no, there we go. Out it comes. This is just um, this is just uh, material that's come out of the lobster, the fluid that's come out of the lobster and congealed during boiling. So, no no value to that. But this is what we want: the nice, shreddable, sweet lobster meat. There we are. So that's how you get the meat out of a lobster. Uh, the next time you see us, we'll have broken this up, we'll add it to the sauce, um, and we'll start the process of stuffing the lobsters. So we've just we've had a, we've got a um, sauce here that started to cool down. Uh, this is the tamale that we've just added. Uh, you can see it just looks like a relatively unappetizing browny green goop, but you won't see that once it's stored it's stirred into sauce. Uh, just going to just going to mix an egg yolk in here, which will again add for a bit of colour and help it to help it to come together once it's once it starts to be grilled. So we've separated the meat from the lobster here. Uh, we've ch we've chunked the. Uh, we've ripped the, the claw. We've ripped these bits of claw up uh, to bite-sized chunks, and then we've got these sections of tail that we've uh, chopped up. So then, that then all goes into here. Give it a nice mix around. You can see, it's a very, it's a nice thick, uh, nice thick consistency, which will hold together. And then. What we've done in the meantime, quickly, is just um, given these a clean out. So we've removed all the mouth parts and all the digestive systems um, and uh, at the stomach sac, etc. Just giving them a quick rinse out. Uh, so we so these now are just for display purpose, really. And what we're going to do is we're going to line up this uh, this lobster meat into the shells, um, alternating claw and tail. Pour the rest of the sauce over it so it fills. Uh, Great a little bit of cheese over the top and then grill it for about five minutes just to give it a bit of colour on the top. In the meantime, I'm just going to put some fries in the oven uh, and we're going to have a very uh, very bougie dinner this evening of, uh, of lobster thermidor and skinny fries. So we've already done it a bit with the sauce uh, and you see some of it start to run out down the side of the lobster shells, but I wouldn't worry about that. All the lobster meat is contained within the shells. Um, so we're going to just give it the rest of the cheese that we grated before. Um, they're nice and full. You can see the lobster meat all stacked up in the shell there. So, and that because we've reduced that sauce down, even though some of it is leaking out, um, it's thick enough to kind of hold itself together, uh, and that'll give us a lovely, a lovely mix of lobster and cream and cheese and herb as it comes out. So that's now going to go into the grill. We've got our fries on in there, at about 200 degrees. Um, they need about five minutes left. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put them on the lower shelf, turn the grill on, uh, and then we'll leave the lobster on the top shelf for about five, six minutes. So it's got a nice colour, and that should be enough time for the fries to finish. And then we'll see with the finished product. So we're just going to serve up our lobsters. They've been grilling on high for about five minutes. So they've got some colour on them. And what I'll do is I'll scrape out all this remainder of sauce 
and we're having this uh, very simply with some fries. So what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll scrape this all together and put it just on the side after I've served the fries. So I've just got the rest of this cheesy, lovely Thermidor sauce, um, and just before serving, I'm just going to put a generous helping of that across the fries. If the veg police are watching, I'm sorry we haven't got one of our five a day on this plate, but this is a treat. Bonus lobster thermidor and fries. There we have it. Tasty. Awesome. Well, there we go. There's a finished product, guys, and it tasted delicious. Thanks very much for watching. Any questions at all, pop them in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.